The Seattle Seahawks play in the NFL's loudest stadium. How do you handle the crowd noise in Seattle? You don't talk. It's like being at the end of a runway. You live near this stadium, you are sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> the Seahawks also have the NFL's loudest player. Kaepernick's going to air it out deep, and it's going to be picked off at the 50 yard line by Richard Sherman. Trash talking cornerback Richard Sherman. And Sherman was dancing with the seagulls after that interception. I thought this was a matchup. Mismatch. Every now and then on the field, I'll say a little bit here, a little bit there. Get your own weak off the field. Get your own weak off the field. Get your own weak off the field. Everybody sees it as trash talk. No, he's 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 arrogant. Uh huh. You suck. You wanted this noise. You wanted this noise. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it trash talk. I'd call it more responding because that's that's pretty much what I do. 88 talked all that noise. Now he's complaining. Sherman responds a lot. He's dubbed the NFL draft a sham, been sucker punched on national television. At the end of this game, Richard Sherman of the Seahawks and Trent Williams of the Redskins got into it. And gone after the NFL's biggest star on Twitter. Brady lays it out over the top, and it's intercepted. Ball is picked off by Richard Sherman. Seahawks corner Richard Sherman said this about Tom Brady on Twitter after the game. Quote, he told me and Earl to see him after the game. When they win, I found him after. Then there was the incident before Super Bowl 47, when Sherman crashed Bourbon Street with a Bleacher Report camera crew. You guys played against both Darrell Revis and Richard Sherman this year. Who's the better lockdown Sherman's corner? Sherman's too fat and slow. Fat and slow. Who do you think is the better lockdown corner? Oh, Revis, no doubt. No doubt. This guy right here, Sherman, he always said that he the best lockdown, he ain't. Richard Sherman, nice to meet you. How are you shut up, are you? Hey, Richard Sherman, nice are to meet you. you? Pleasure I'm to meet you. I'm sorry, no. Oh, it's okay. It's all good. It's, all... it's easy to just say, Darrell Revis, he's the best corner. You know, I don't even have to look at anything to know that. I remember I tweeted something like, my this year's stats were looking like his career stats. Everybody's like, oh, you're not as good as him, you're not as good as him, you're not as good as him. But they can never give me any numbers to support that evidence, any numbers to, to contradict what I've said. Richard Sherman hiding in the tall grass. Who picks off Sanchez? They don't want to do any homework. They don't want to study. That would take some humbling. That kick is blocked. It's picked up. Coming the other way. Sherman, he's gonna score. They would have to say this fifth round, 154th pick, who nobody wanted, has become the best corner in football in his second year playing the position. And that's a tough pill for people to swallow. People only see that side of him, the trash talk or whatever. They'll either love him or hate him. He's a different person off the field. He's a loving person, he's a caring person. He's a very easygoing young man. Everybody who knows Richard likes Richard. Richard just doesn't walk around town talking trash. <laughs> Sherman is a self-proclaimed nerd with a degree from Stanford. But the NFL's biggest trash talker received his first and most important education from a garbage man. My dad works sanitation for the city of LA, and he's done that for close to 30 years now. Every day since I've ever been capable of understanding, he's woke up at four o'clock in the morning and went to work. And he gets back around two in the afternoon. The next day he works at four o'clock in the morning. I drive a trash truck for the city of Los Angeles. It's a job that I don't too much like, but I've done it all my life, so. And, uh, you know, it was, to provide for my family. The only goal that I had for my son was education, to make sure that he got more education than I got, and to make sure that he was in a better position than I was. He works every holiday because he gets overtime. This year, he had to leave on Christmas, right after we opened presents and everything, to go back to L.A. because he had work in the morning. I sent them to Cancun for their anniversary, and they had to come back early so they can go to work. That kind of hard work and that kind of work ethic, that kind of blue collar mentality is kind of what got me to where I am. 
Sherman grew up alongside his older brother Branton on the streets of Compton, where gang violence was part of everyday life. Right now we're at our, what used to be our house. When we lived here, it was green though. So it was a little bit different now. Used to have bums come in the house and you know take some of the leftover food from the night before. Yeah. We had bums that would halfway like babysit us. They like, were basically they, they were basically. Us ba I mean, because my mom and dad had to work all day. Out here on New Year's to celebrate, it's not only fireworks in the air. They shoot guns. It's fireworks. It's fireworks. <laughs> Real guns. That was just normal life. I mean, you, you don't know any other way. You don't know that it, that's as dangerous as it gets. You know, hearing gunshots, but it's where you're from. It's what you are and. So you can't pick where you're from. My kids grew up in the area of Watts. I really wasn't afraid of anything. Never a time where gangs really, like, uh, you know, caused problems with either one of my kids because they knew us. They respected us. In the inner city, it's not the smallest place in the world, but it's also not the biggest. My mom, she's always involved, whether it's she's the team mom for our football team. She's at our school baking stuff. She's involved in every facet of our life, and it created such a family atmosphere. Everybody wanted to protect the family. People who didn't really know us that well, even though they were doing the most reputable things, they didn't want to see her kids fail. Most of the time when we went out and messed with those guys, they'd have so much respect for my mother and father that they'd be like, hey, I mean, what, what are you doing out here, boy? <laughs> Go home. Like, I know your mom and dad, like, this isn't your lifestyle. Like, they were guardian angels or something like, hey, get away from here, you know, because you could be on this same corner when the guys come through and shoot this corner up. One of his, you know, best friends who was killed Richard's first year at Stanford, he just happened to be in the wrong place at the, at wrong, the wrong time. time. The kid just came over to visit and, you know, he ended up getting shot. That was one of his best buddies, Scooby. Richard kept him with him everywhere he went. I think it just taught him a, a, a lot of life lessons. You want to do what he would have been able to do, what he would have wanted you to do. I'm going to make sure his memory lives on and that other kids hear about him, other kids hear about the story, other kids know there's other ways to get out of this place than being dead or in jail. We weren't the richest people in the world, and we we're incredibly wealthy in a lot of other areas. We knew the right from wrong, and we knew exactly. it was a very strict line from exactly. right from wrong. When I went off to college, people always thought, you know, they didn't know what to think of me. Trying to figure out how I got to Stanford from, you know, such a bad place. Exactly. Everybody keeps saying, like, it's an oxymoron. It's like, you're a moron if you think it's an oxymoron. The stereotypes you get from, from seeing TV or seeing these movies, most people don't know anything about Compton. There are some incredible people that come out of Compton. Incredible people still in Compton, still in Watts. And people just use the stereotypes to shape their mind in a certain way and judge people. And I think it's, it's awful to judge people. As much as Sherman loathes stereotypes, he can't help playing into them. The front man for Seattle's Legion of Boom secondary keeps playing at an ear-splitting volume. Richard Sherman steps in front, picks it off. Ball game, baby! The best one in the league! Richard Sherman may be the best in the league right now. He's not afraid to tell you either. Over the last two years, Sherman has intercepted more passes than any player in football. In 2012, he was named All-Pro, but his peers did not send him to the Pro Bowl. Apparently, I just rub people the wrong way. I may not ever make a Pro Bowl the way I play the game. You know, I play hard. I laid him down. Lay down. I don't play the game to make friends. I'm not out there shaking hands and slapping people on the butt during the game. They call me All-Pro, but I don't really know. No Pro Bowl, but I'm at the top, though. Uh. <laughs> The people that vote are the players, and when you're getting rubbed the wrong way, you don't want to vote for a guy. They vote for their friends. Richard Sherman will never top the popularity charts, but when you cut through the noise, he's got plenty to shout about. Richard Sherman comes out of nowhere to knock that ball down in the end zone. And each offseason, the Seahawks cornerback takes his one-man circus where it's needed most. From the Seattle Seahawks, we have number 25 cornerback, Richard Sherman! Don't think just because you've been born in the inner city in this situation that you can't be who you want to be. You have to be your own leader. You can't follow people and then get mad when you, when you, when, at the end of the day, when you're somewhere you shouldn't be. 
I made it to graduate from college, to play in the NFL. You can too. You can, you can be whatever you really want to be. People think the best feelings in the world are when you score a touchdown in front of millions of people. That's not the best feeling for me. Uh, in my opinion, the best feeling is when you, when you help somebody who has nothing. Some kids are orphaned, and they're like, how do you do it when you don't have parents, when you don't have a support system? How do you do it when, when your dad's a gang member or your mom's addicted to drugs? I tell them where there is a will, there is a way. You, get, you keep my number, you call me. I'll find out a way for you to get it done. We're still right here in the hood. Shoot, I used to live right there. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, yeah. yeah I went to 99, shoot. You know oh, yeah? What I mean? yeah? Yeah. I'm from Compton. People don't understand it. But that's where I'm from. I'm wearing it as a bag of strength, not hiding it for all the kids that are in my cities. That's why I always kind of, you know, put my hands out when I make big plays, because it's like, this is, this is it. You work hard, you become disciplined. What you set your mind to, anything's possible.